My name is Don K. Preston. I am the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma. We are, let's remember, we're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and the doctrine of the resurrection. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 56, that the resurrection would be when sin, the sting of death, would be overcome. Thus, to deal with sin is to deal with death. And we're looking at the comparison between Romans 5 to 8 and 1 Corinthians 15. In both sets of passages, Paul is dealing with Adamic death, the death of Adam that came through sin. Sin. Well, guess what? Had Adam, had Adam not sinned, then he would not have died the very day he sinned. And by the way, I am in the process of writing a book entitled The Death of Adam, The Life of Christ uh, to demonstrate what kind of death it was that Adam died the day he sinned. It's absolutely amazing to me, and I mean no disrespect at all, but it's absolutely amazing to me how uh, different commentators and Bible students want to impose on that text, want to impose on that context something that is simply not there, and that's all because of preconceived ideas about physical resurrection. Well, the passage before us this morning is a classic example in which Paul's writings present a daunting, I would say, insurmountable problem for the traditional view of death and resurrection. Paul says, there is, in Romans 8, let's start with verse 1 again, okay? There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Now, I want you to ask yourself the question, what was the law of sin and death? Well, very simply stated, it was, you sin, you die, right? That's easy. That's not even really debatable. Oh, but wait, that is the law of the garden. God said, Genesis 2, 16 and 17, to Adam and Eve, of every fruit, of every tree that is in the midst of the garden, you may surely eat thereof. However, of the fruit of the tree, of the knowledge of good and evil, you may not eat thereof, for in the day you eat thereof, you will surely die. Now, that's the law of sin and death. If you sin, if you violate my law, i.e. if you sin, you will surely die. Well, we are told Adam and Eve, when they sinned, we are told they were sentenced to death. That's not what the text says. We are told they begin to die physically. Uh, in fact, just uh, over the holidays, I was reading one commentator, and he said Adam and Eve were created immortal, but the moment they sinned, they lost their immortality. Really? What an interesting claim. You're immortal, but you lost your immor they lost their immortality through sin. But, of course, the text doesn't say, you will become mortal. So the text does not say what Bible students demand that it says. I've had people go on absolute tirades talking about physical death absolutely must be part, at least part, of the death that God threatened them with. But here's the point. Okay. Now, look, I, I, I'm developing all of this in the book that I mentioned, The Death of Adam, The Life of Christ. The bottom line is, the law of sin and death said, you sin, you die. 
So let me ask you this question. If physical mortality, if physical death is the death of the law of sin and death, why is it? Why is it that every single infant born into this world, having no sin whatsoever, none, zero, zilch, is already subject to physical death? And furthermore, if in fact physical death is the direct result of sin, I mean, after all, the wages of sin is death, and we are told, of course, that's physical death, then we're back to the question that I have posed repeatedly in this series. If it is the case that biological death is the result of sin, then since the child of God is forgiven of sin, Why does the child of God still die? Because we have no sin through the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. Isn't that what Paul's saying? The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made made me free from the law of sin and death. If I am in Christ, I'm free from the law of sin and death. If the law of sin and death means when I die, when I sin, I will die physically, then guess what? I should never die physically. Now, as we're going to see as we proceed in this study, not at this point, but when we are through with our comparison between Romans 5 to 8 and 1 Corinthians 15, we're going to do a brief study of the book of John. And Jesus' promise in the book of John, if a man keep my saying, he will never die. Well, isn't that Romans 8 too? The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Of course it's the same promise. But you see, folks, we just simply have to catch the power that Paul in Romans 5 to 8 is talking about the same problem of sin that Adam had. He is talking about the same death that entered through Adam. As in Adam, all men die. And he's talking about the same deliverance from that death. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ has made me free from the law of sin and death. And I want to tell you what, folks, the the efforts, the, the verbal gymnastics that are necessary to avoid the power and the beauty of what Paul says here are astounding, but most of all, they're unscriptural. And we will continue this study as we see Paul's discussion of the law of the spirit of life in Christ has set me free from the law of sin and death. Is not Paul saying that he was living in the very time in which resurrection life was becoming an absolute reality? If not, why not? We will see more on this on the flip side. In the meantime, please get a copy of this book, The Resurrection of Daniel chapter 12 verse 2, Fulfilled or Future. You will be absolutely amazed at the power of the Bible in its discussion and in its definition of the law of sin and death and the glory and the power of the life that is ours in Christ Jesus. We'll see you on the flip side.